Welcome to the Building Science Podcast. Welcome to this. Uh, okay. Oh, welcome to the Building Science. To the Building Science Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Building Science Podcast. <laughs> Bringing the human factor to architecture and design. Brought to you by Positive Energy in Austin, Texas. Hello and welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. I'm Christoph Irwin here, as always, with my sidekick, Miguel. Hey, everyone. Before we get into this, we got to pay the bills. Here's an ad. Greetings, Building Science enthusiasts, and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. Mark your calendars now and don't miss the 2019 ATX Building Performance Conference on May 17th in Austin, Texas. The Humid Climate Conference and friends will be putting on a day-long meeting of the minds to discuss everything from air barriers to the best brisket in Texas, with speakers like Dr. Joe Stebrick of the Building Science Corporation and Dwayne Dahman, FAIA of the City of Seattle. This will be a heavy hitting day, and the event will also feature an assembly mock up rodeo. So get yourself over to humidclimateconference.org now to register. Yeehaw! <laughs> okay, and we're back. So today we are going to be getting an insider's view of a very important part of your house that you might have never seen, and it's your air distribution system, your duct system, which consists of your equipment, the plenums, the ducts, the runouts, the diffusers. So today we have with us, we have uh, Sean Harris and Ian Harris from Austin Aero Seal and Austin Aero Barrier and actually soon to be one company, IAQ Texas. Hey, in fact, why don't we just start with that? Why are you rebranding? Why are you changing the name? Well, we... Oh, and hello and welcome. Oh, hello. Yes, <laughs> my name is Ian and I'm with Aero Seal of Austin, Aero Barrier of Austin, and now <laughs> IAQ Texas. <laughs> Uh, what happened was we started off with Aero Seal, and we now have Aero Barrier in our toolbox, as it were. And so it actually worked out a lot better if we rebranded and became IAQ Texas. Indoor air quality is a, a big uh, term topic now. Yeah, and important. so with Aero Barrier coming on board, we didn't yeah. want the confusion. Uh, what we do is we solve an indoor air quality issues and we have a whole slew of tools in which to do that and so it just made sense to Mm -hmm. rebrand as IAQ Texas and those are the couple of main products that we offer. Mm -hmm. One one of being which um, is our knowledge and that's the key part of it is the most important ingredient. Having the knowledge to figure out what is causing the problem. Yeah Mm -hmm. and so the challenge for you Sean is to very briefly describe what Aero Seal is and what Aero Barrier is. Great. So, um, <laughs> Aero Seal uh, developed first back in the 90s uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs in California. Funding from the Department of Energy, it basically seals up ductwork automatically. So, we pressurize the duct system, we introduce an aerosol, and it seals everything up to 5 eighths of an inch. Uh, We track this with a manometer measuring the pressures inside the ductwork, and we can typically seal a system that's leaking hundreds of CFM down to single digits sometimes. So really, really tight uh, tight duct systems, which is great for indoor air quality, efficiency, and comfort. Mm-hmm. So you didn't say fix a flat for ducts. Ah, fix a flat for ducts. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> sort of the the main phrase I like using because it just automatically takes care of it, similar to the way fix a flat does, uh, but without the chemicals. So that's Aero Seal, Aero Barrier. Could you say it's like fix a flat for enclosures? <laughs> Definitely. So Aero Barrier, uh, very very similar technology. Uh, we pressurize the building envelope and then automatically we introduce this sealant into the air and it automatically finds all of the leaks and seals them up. Uh, um, slightly different technology and slightly different um, type of sealant, uh, but overall, they're pretty much the same same principles. Okay, so. good. And there's an episode on that where we interviewed the uh, founder and CEO, I guess, of AeroBerry. That'll be coming out shortly. So for today, one of the first things I wanted to talk about, and we can get into AeroBerry toward the end, but I wanted to talk about, I've been looking around trying to think, who would I know to answer the question of, What does the inside of a duct system look like? A typical duct system in a typical house. And of course, what's typical? And uh, specifically, one of the challenges I've had is, uh, you know, running positive energy over the last 10 years is a lot of installing contractors say to me, hey, Christoph, 
you're cuckoo. It's not a problem. If there were a problem with duct systems, I would know it. If there were, were a problem with humidity control, I would know it. Um, that's a separate story. So uh, when it comes to duct systems... Just what's the? I'll give you the basic question. It, it, are, do they basically look all okay? Is there a problem? What do you think? Yeah. So um, obviously, the the first answer is it depends. Uh, it depends <laughs> on all yeah. sorts of different things. Client usage. If there was humidity events or something like that. Um, one of the other things that we do, aside from sealing ductwork to improve indoor air quality, is we also clean ductwork to improve indoor air quality. Uh-huh. And so we actually get to look inside of all the ducts when we do clean and seals and things like that, uh, which gives me, I think, a, a different um, set of experiences than an HVAC contractor or even a regular duct cleaner or something like that who is just cleaning ducts and not really caring about improving the indoor air quality. Their job is just to clean. Mm -hmm. My goal when I clean duct work and seal duct work isn't just to clean something or seal something. It's actually to make a difference and an yeah. impact in people's lives. Yeah. I was so, thinking when people say they're duct cleaning companies, often they're like, I am a uh, company that runs the duct cleaning equipment inside your ducts and then hopes that they ended up clean because of that. Right. And you know, one of the things that they don't understand is that when Sean gets in there to, to get into the attic and get close to the plenums and the distribution boxes, he's actually opened up every single one of them and doing a visual inspection. And a lot of times people say to us, you know, when they want us to come clean their ducts, is, wow, you charge so much more. And we were like, well, you get what you pay for. Yeah. We're doing a full inspection. And in a lot of cases, we're actually doing uh, hand cleaning and not allowing our equipment to clean because the, the elements are too sensitive to mm. stir up all that stuff with the equipment. Yeah. So you look at every aspect of it. Like when yeah. you do a clean and seal, mm-hmm. you first clean, mm-hmm. which means you open up. Yes, it's like opening up my arteries somehow while they're still in my body. That's just amazing. So, yeah, so we try and get uh, to the ducts from both directions. So uh, typically we'll go to the the main plenum, and we'll cut a hole in there, and we'll clean out the plenum really thoroughly, and then we can get to all of the – basically that's the main distribution part for the ducts, so we can then get to the ends of those ducts, and we clean down from that direction, and then we also take off the registers inside the space, and we clean – up from that direction. So between those two things, uh, I can really see a lot of what's going on inside of all of the ducts. Every single duct, uh, we take pictures before and after. So I have hundreds and thousands of pictures um, on on my phone of just before and afters of, of duct cleanings. And um, it's pretty surprising on, on what happens there. Um, so here goes the answer to the question. <laughs> generally are they clean generally are they generally they are dirty in our climate zone with how things are looking most people don't have standalone dehumidifiers and things like that to control humidity so there's a lot of buildup somewhere in the system uh you know depending on how bad build up it is of... <laughs> uh build up of possible microbial growth of uh-huh, some kind some uh-huh. sort of discoloration is happening uh-huh. and so you're not allowed to say mold you're not you're trying not to Correct. Uh, you know, I'm not um, a right. mediator or somebody right, who can right. tell someone that they have mold. So I, I don't. I try not to use that language. Also, it's kind of scary language. People, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a four-letter word. You know, you don't want to tell me say that. fungal. Um, That's six letters. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I haven't thought about fungal. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, what happens is the the moisture is going to congregate at the coldest spots. So those spots are going to be the coil and where the, the termination device, the, the register, is going to be. So those are the two coldest spots with the highest humidity uh, relatively, and those are the places where mold is going to grow first. Um, so those are, the, for, you know, the, those are the places we focus on a lot by cleaning by hand. Um, if there's high humidity events that happen inside the home. And by that specifically, what do you mean? Like not controlling humidity will lead to some high humidity events, but you mean like flooding or uh, yeah, water so leak in the it, attic exactly. from a roof leak? It could be all sorts of different things. Um, it or could the, be the faucet broke. and mm. Yeah, it could be some sort of water event. It could be uh, a bunch of people came over and showered or the doors got left open on the wrong day and mm-hmm. a bunch of humidity came into the house. Mm. Um, and what I'm noticing is that it either starts from the the plenum and the coil, the coldest surface there, and slowly grows out through the ducts, or it starts at the register and slowly goes back the other way. Fascinating. And yeah, it is interesting to see, uh, depending on the humidity event, I guess, type of humidity, which is really hard to sort of read into, but 
most of the time, the center of the duct is relatively clean in comparison to the, the And so clean would mean it's just register. dusty, probably. Probably just dusty, exactly. And we've seen a lot, right, where it's a room that somebody doesn't use, and they've, they've tried to dampen down that vent mm-hmm, mm-hmm. by shutting that off. But they, re- they don't realize that all of the cold... Uh, air just hangs piles up yeah. at that register and then causes that humidity and yeah. and also leakage yeah because wow. it doesn't really work right mm-hmm. wow that's fascinating so I just want to summarize it because because I'm getting a mental picture I want to make sure other people are getting it so basically there's the coil which is the obviously the coldest part of the air conditioning system and it blows out of the equipment chassis into the supply plenum which is then probably the next coldest part and the plenum is uh, like a big interconnection box where all the supply ducts connect. Um, and so the plenum itself has has some of this... Well, let's just use fungal growth for this podcast, or fungi, or I'm tempted to say let's just use mold. But, so it has some fungal growth on the plenum. And in fact, you came to my house and took pictures of it, and there's this nice... I shouldn't say nice. There's this <laughs> disgusting-looking uh, kind of Gaussian curve where you can just tell the... Air flows shooting out, and it flutes out, shoots out farthest in the middle, so the mold goes farthest. I guess I'm using mold in the middle of my plenum, top and bottom, and then less far on the edges. Mm-hmm. Um, and since my dedicated dehumidifier is in there, I guess it's desiccated now, and I've blown all the mycelial fragments into my air. Yikes. I'm glad I got good filters. But basically, it's coldest at the front where the coil is, so if you're pulling humid air out of the house, if you're not controlling humid air, the return will take that humid air, it'll blow it into this cold air stream going through the coil, and then you'll get this fungal growth going from the plenum down the ducts. And I'm trying and the other one is you get it starting from the diffuser, like you were saying, Ian, they close the registers. They close the the grit they close the um, dampers or the yeah, the, the volume control dampers on the terminal device, on the diffuser. So then the situation is it's filled with cold air and yeah it just gets colder and colder and then the, the moisture is going to be below dew point it's going to condense out um but even if they don't close the registers do you sometimes see it coming from the definitely yes and um i feel like we live in sort of this this tipping point from a dew point perspective yeah um you know typical comfort is about 50 55 degree dew point right, is yeah. that right uh-huh. 55 and, to go 52 to 57 the yeah. air coming out of our registers is typically about 55 degrees so if the air coming out of a register mm-hmm. is the same as the dew point of comfortable air then if you make that any colder, well, now you're condensing moisture, and mm-hmm. now the mm-hmm. dust in the air can come to where that moisture is. And so because we live in such a tipping point, you change anything. You um, cook too much. You shower too much without using proper exhaust fans and things. Yeah. Uh, you're going to then get that humidity up enough where the dew point is um, wow. is a lot higher. So, um, so, yeah, so the other thing to note here is that uh, our – sort of industry, what I see the most and what I clean the most is going to be duckboard and flex. And uh, I have loads of pictures I can show you, Christoph, about... Maybe just share one or two on the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and about how much um, growth happens inside flex duct um, on the plastic, on flex on the plastic wow. surface of the flex duct. Exactly. Yeah, there's, there's quite a bit. Um, typically... It's hard to say exactly what it is, if it's maybe the dust that settles in the middle of the flex and sort of down on the bottom, which then causes the growth to happen on the dust, um, or whether it's just like the microporosity of the mm-hmm. plastic. I don't really know what, what the cause is. Yeah. Um, I just know that whenever we look in metal ductwork, it is... Uh, Dusty, but never, very rarely is there any sort of growth on the metal surface. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the time, it's it's pretty clean, mm-hmm. dusty, but you know, no discoloration or, or mold or anything. In right. There. So, um, you know, obviously, we know that the metal has uh, zinc in it, and zinc is a natural uh, biocide, and uh, it's going to, you know, sort of prevent those sorts of things from happening. You'd still think you would see it on top of the dirt or something. A little bit, And I yeah. just don't. And that's what's interesting is that my experience when we clean metal ductwork is we're getting it super clean from a dust perspective and then we don't have to worry about the growth in it. That's so. fascinating. So what about percent? Like, you know, I might realize we're giving all kinds of trying to put quantifies to things that just aren't quantifiable. But you go to 10 houses. How many of them have metal ductwork? How many of them have flex duct and duct board in Austin? 
Mm. Or San Antonio. Um, yeah, I would say pretty much all ten would be uh, <laughs> flux duct. Yeah. Um, okay, how many houses do you have to go to before you have one? That's... I know exactly. It's it's hard. Um, I actually was just in a duct assessment this afternoon where um, a house built in the eighties seems like a relative, like a quasi custom house, and uh, originally they installed duckboard, duckboard trunk lines everywhere. Um, <laughs> And so, at least they didn't use the building cavities <laughs> upstairs and downstairs. And then at some point, very shortly after, uh, the duckboard trunk lines in the attic were changed all to metal. Hmm. And so they have now um, a metal plenum that's internally lined with uh, with fiberglass insulation, and then they have metal ducts going all across to all of the uh, the registers. And um, this house had a humidity event, uh, had a roof leak, and the homeowner didn't realized that there was a roof leak for a very long time and uh, eventually mold was coming in on the ceilings and all the registers were just black so you see these black registers uh, you take down the register and you look inside and you've got this nice clean metal duct all the way back Um, and so it's spotless metal duct but yet there's uh, black what used to be a white register is now black uh, on the outside of that so Um, anyway, so yeah, I'm I'm a real big fan of metal ductwork, but it's sort of rare rare to see nowadays. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of the reasons why when we're doing ductboard, uh, clean and seal, the first thing Sean will do is cut into the ductboard because it does get to a certain point where we recommend replacement mm-hmm. and not actual clean and seal, just because it just has too much growth. Mm-hmm. So there's ten houses. How many? Do you have a question, Miguel? Well, so so I'm, I'm curious about metal duct work because we've had feedback from architects and builders elsewhere in the country that we work with that it, when we describe flex duct and duct board systems, they say that's actually the exception in other climates, especially up north. So mm-hmm. it seems that there's a regional bias toward this material, and you're obviously working in this region. Um, and you know what's interesting is we, we belong to a, uh, a, a closed group Facebook page for aeroseal mm-hmm. dealers, hmm. and we talk with them all the time through this Facebook page, and it's really fascinating because you're right, up in the north where they heat and cool mm-hmm. a lot, they have this metal ductwork. Yeah. But what's crazy is, for some reason, the people that are installing it can't get it tight. Huh. Every mm-hmm. house has at least 600 CFM of And so they constantly, uh, now it's become the norm where they just aeroseal every single house. They don't (laughs) test it. The actual testing is done at the end of the seal. Oh, you should move up there. And and so it's an interesting uh, dilemma is they've got much better quality ductwork, but it's as leaky as can be. So they aeroseal it, and then you've got it perfect. So just to remind everybody, I'm always talking about the weight of air. 600 CFM is something like... 450 pounds of air a minute leaking out of their duct system, right? So that's not trivial. Can you bench that? (laughs) No. (laughs) Certainly not in a minute if you broke it up into small chunks. (laughs) back to those 10 houses, you mentioned sometimes you didn't just need to replace it. So basically, you've said that probably all 10 are ductboard plenums, mm-hmm. flex duct runouts. How many do you think out of 10 would you estimate might be replaced? Is it one or is it maybe you'd have to go to 20 or 30 before you actually say, yeah. you need to replace this one? So uh, most of the duct, like it depends on what's what age of house, right? So if we're talking about a house that was built in, um, you know, I don't know, within the last 10 years, most likely there's not going to be much growth in There's probably going to be some growth uh, in the plenum in particular and maybe some of the poorest spots in the, um, like, supply buckets and things like that. Wow, but, so even just um, 10-year-old houses you're seeing Depending all, on the seeing. humidity in the home, exactly. Um, so, but most of the time those are pretty clean. So I wouldn't say that there would be a major issue with a house that's 10 years old. You get into the 15- and 20-year-old houses or the houses that um, have had uh, either poorly maintained or continuous high humidity or um, like we went to this one guy's house who he has a gym so he owned a four bedroom house and converted three of the bedrooms into like a different body part so like 
the living room with squats. So living room is leg day, basically. Wow. And then you, you go upstairs and you do upper, like, you know, whatever, bench press. He lived room. here or he had friends um, come over and use it as a gym? He was just a bodybuilder. And yeah. so he just converted his house into, into this. The game, of, the game room was all treadmills. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, it's, it's good that he wasn't skipping leg day. You know, that's a big problem. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, so, you know, if you're using your house in that way, you're going to create a lot of humidity. Uh, you know, he also had three dogs. So there's a lot of dust going on there. And the dust was half an inch thick in some places. It was it was huge in the so, ducks in the ducks exactly. a half inch thick yeah, of yeah, dust. Yeah. Oh my! God. And, and that's the other thing that I want to sort of um, the, a bit of wisdom I want to impart to people is you know when you're in houses I don't know who might be listening to this but if you look up at the return and you see some some clumping a little bit of the dust on the return the clumping is indicative of high humidity. So there yeah. was some high humidity for long periods of time that caused that dust to sort of clump up. Um, different than just a coating of dust on it. You think we could get a picture of the clumping to show people? Yeah, definitely. definitely. All right, we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, you know, I've actually observed that exact phenomena pre-dehumidifier and post-dehumidifier mm, in my that's house. That's great. And the difference is, is pretty striking. Mm-hmm. And it's we don't even have, a, I would say, a fully sized dehumidifier for our house, but just controlling it and keeping that humidity level is... Mm-hmm stable is, is a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I don't want my friends to never invite me back over to their homes, <laughs> but I will say I'm an interesting dude to invite to your house. So I was over at my friend's house recently. And, uh, first thing I noticed when I walk in the door is it smelled musty, right? Which is a friendly way to say you've got mold and you've got mildew in your house. Mildew is mold on a surface. And, you know, I didn't like run screaming from the building, but sitting down, we're eating dinner. And, uh, I find out that they're happy because they just got a nice new air conditioner. Their old one broke and they got this nice new air conditioner. And their house is built in the 70s, original duct system. And I'm just like kind of shaking my head internally like, if you only knew. Like when they say nice new air conditioning system, they mean like the indoor unit and the outdoor unit. And they had a gas furnace, right? So they only mean just one little box, the cold box upstairs. And they got this like horribly moldy duct system almost for sure, right? They're on a here in beam house with a crawl space. And so it's a shame that the average person in our society that would be like, Oh God, I'm not going to use a flip phone. Are you kidding me? You know, no, I'm not going to look at the rear view mirror. I want to dump them on my dashboard. They will say nice new air conditioner to this thing when they just replace small pieces of it. It's, Mm-hmm. And that's where they really have to rely on the professional that's coming out. Yeah. We had a neighbor recently, and she said to me, I need to get a new furnace. And I said, well, do yourself a favor. Replace Don't. both things at the same time. Mm-hmm. You're indoors. Or get a heat pump. And, and she, uh, yes, exactly. And she turned around and she said, no, you don't understand. I don't need a new air conditioning system. We had that replaced three years ago. What I need is a new furnace. I'm like, are you really serious? You had somebody come out and replace your outdoor unit without replacing both at the same time. And she said, well, why not? Mm -hmm. What what sort of air conditioning person would go out there and and do that? Mm -hmm. It's like not taking care of the customer. I just don't understand it. Yeah. That's a hard place to go. I mean, but that's that's where we are. Over and over is... uh yeah, how do you talk about this politely? You know, the the fact that there are people out there that society relies on to give good information and they can have high integrity and, you know, a lot of discipline and exertion and yet they don't give society what it really needs. They don't know and they sometimes don't even know they don't know. And people like us get the aggression when you're basically going <clears throat> Uh, you don't know, <laughs> or you don't know what you don't know. You know, mm-hmm. there you go. That's fun. You don't know what you don't know. You know. <laughs> um, that might be the title of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. So, summarizing, um, how many out of ten would probably have dirty? Duckboard supply plenums. Yeah, so if we're talking about newer houses, we're probably talking about one out of ten. If we're okay. talking about older houses, so like um, 20, 15, year old. 20 years old, we're talking about probably half or more, depending on the environment and what it's been exposed to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, it's okay. And it, like, let me just like take a step back here. Yeah. Just because you see a little bit of dirt in a duck system, to me, does not mean that you need to get it cleaned. If you're on top of your humidity, 
uh, that that dirt is probably going to be fine. Uh, you know, from a small particulate perspective, you are going to be impeding your indoor air quality, but not significantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when I when, when I go in to do uh, assessments and things, uh, there are times where I see some dirt and I take some pictures and I say, "Hey, I see that you have this dirt. If you would like us to clean, we can." But this dirt is not that big of a deal. You know, I don't want people going through great lengths mm-hmm. just to clean up a little bit of dust or something. You know, that's that's not what, you know, that to me is what most duck cleaners do is they're just out there to clean. And that's not what we do. We're out there to improve and make an impact. Right, so. right. Or maybe but let's go back to that. Out there to clean. They're out there to run their equipment, their cleaning equipment. You know, it's mm-hmm. like you ask your kid to wash your hands, and you need to, you needed to say, "Make your hands clean." Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, so, like you say, it really depends because dust for some people can be a big deal. Correct. Like asthmatics or allergy sufferers. Um, it really so depends. So you guys have a challenging role here. Um, all right. So, but back to the air distribution systems. So, so the material choices are. Flex duct and duckboard, and could you describe duckboard just to make sure everybody knows what it is? Yeah, so duckboard is essentially this um, board that is <laughs> made out of uh, fiberglass. Ducks. Yeah, made out of ducts. <laughs> uh, fiberglass on the inside uh, for insulation, and the exterior liner is typically some sort of foil that is reinforced with some sort of um, seam in it that's going to keep it strong. Uh, so the airliner is on the outside, then you've got fiberglass, and the new stuff has a liner on the inside that's sort of like a resin-coated liner that then stops any of those fibers from becoming airborne. Uh, Because I don't know if you know this, Chris, but in California, fiberglass can cause cancer. Oh, in California. Um, in California, Thank yeah, goodness yeah. we're in Texas. Uh, basically, California has come out with a lot of statements about different things that can cause cancer. And definitely, you know, I don't mean to joke about it. It's a serious thing. It can, you know, yeah. longer exposures cause it. But um, essentially, um, what you want to do there is make sure that none of that fiberglass enters your airstream because that can definitely impact your, mm-hmm. your indoor air quality. But... Um, the porous nature of it uh, is going to cause all sorts of issues from a moisture perspective, and really those mold spores and things can really burrow their way in, making it really difficult to clean thoroughly yeah. uh, from that perspective. But, um, but yeah, duckboard is a is a, a component of the duct system that's widely used because it's so easy to work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can cut it and shape it, and you need to get into it real quick. All you need is a knife. You don't need a, a drill and some snips if it were metal or something like that. You mm-hmm. can then easily patch it as well. Uh, uh, so it's a really user-friendly product from that perspective. Um, Transported, it comes in a flat sheet. Correct. Somewhat soundproof. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Helps with acoustics. How do you? Can you r- briefly describe the process of turning it from a flat sheet into a? plenum, which is like a rectangular box. Mm. How do you do that? Yeah, so that that's a great one. So they make these special tools that you can cut grooves out of the uh, the actual fiberglass, and then when you cut out this special groove, you fold So it's like it a 90 degree notch. You uh, some of them are a 90 degree, and others are stair-stepped. So you've got a couple of no- uh, Oh, nines. and the stairs would link mm-hmm. together. And so then when you fold it up, um, you know, I was talking earlier about that in, uh, that resin sort of impregnated layer of the fibers uh, sort of protecting and keeping that fiberglass down. Well, once you've cut into that uh, to create you've exposed the, the corner, non-impregnated. You, exactly. You've now exposed the fiberglass in the corners, which could then potentially become airborne. Um, not necessarily right But if it's right cut away. perfectly, it, you could imagine. It, exactly. If it is cut perfectly, which is difficult to do. That takes some skill. Um, mm-hmm. I've cut quite a bit of it, and it, it takes a lot to be that precise to get it, and I've get seen it all the way. Steel steak knives and fishing knives and, you know, the Leatherman yeah. knife used. Mm-hmm. I mean, exactly. Yeah. There's also definitely a lot of non, you know, imprecise ways to, to cut it as well. Um, but the, the thing also to talk about is, you know, it's not just when it's first made because when it first gets made, there's going to be some residue and hopefully all of that gets blown out in the first couple of times that the AC gets used. What I'm Into also, the air of the house. Into the air of the house, which hopefully <laughs> is while nobody is occupied and it's, you know, just sort of working its way through. Um, um, but the concern I have is the longevity of it, is um, what's going to happen 10 years from now with that duct, uh, or some of the resin or the, the fiberglass or part of the duct even going to break down, mm-hmm. either through um, just age or also from people crawling over the duct in the attic or something like mm-hmm. that, where um, they crush part of the duct and now some of that fiberglass is even more exposed. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, so we folded it up into a box. We've done this 
ductwork origami, sort of. Mm-hmm. Um, so you basically, what, what size does it come in? What size are the sheets? Yeah, so four by eight sheets. Okay. So, you, so this is why you all see a lot of four foot long plenums. Correct. Right? Correct. Instead of having eight foot long, you would take two sheets. What does a sheet cost roughly? Yeah, so that's the next thing to talk about is uh, R6 versus R8. So uh, R6 ductwork is roughly, I think, an inch and a half, and the R8 is roughly two inches. And everything that we have set up is really more designed for that inch and a half duct, uh, not for the, the two inch R8. And what do you mean by that? We have set up. Um, you mean whenever the you're we, uh, the industry, whenever you're making a box to attach to a coil or making you know a distribution box someplace, uh, the starting collars, for example, most uh, of the starting collars that you buy are have a flange on them that are for an inch and a half. Uh, they're not for two inches, so you can't quite get the tabs around the corner just barely. And you're when you're putting the starting collar on, you're sort of pushing that up into the resin impregnated fibers, I guess. And so that's sort of cutting into where you know right there at the collar is going to be where some of the the fibers are loose. Oh yeah. Um, so anyway, so our industry is definitely um, set up for the inch and a half, the R6 more so than uh, than the R8. Um, so anyway, so R8 is also significantly more expensive, sometimes double in some cases. Um, hmm. You know, I, I can't remember the pricing off the top of my head, but it's like you know eighty dollars for a four way sheet of R8 and um, yeah, something like, like thirty seven for the. Uh, I think like yeah, it's like roughly half like forty two or something. I'll I'll look at my supply house and mm-hmm. update that, and I'm sure it's going to vary widely across the country. So don't don't quote me on those numbers. Right, but still, I mean, if you wanted to, like as someone who designs plenums, I would like a longer plenum. I would mm-hmm. prefer not to have it be four feet, especially on a. A higher, like a four ton or four and a half ton or five ton system, there's just not going to be enough room to connect all those ducts. You're going to end up sticking them everywhere, which isn't a great idea. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go into plenum design though, but so you make this duct board box and you connect it to the equipment. How do you connect it to the equipment? How do you connect it to the air handler chassis itself? Different people do it different ways. So that's another hard question to answer. Everybody is there any mechanical connection or is it just? It's there. pretty much reliant upon sealants. Uh, mm-hmm. So it, typically it's taped on. And, uh, after is that what duct tape is for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, duct tape is actually against code. You can't use duct tape on <laughs> ducts. Uh, it just The adhesives in it don't withstand the hot and cold cycles of yeah. an attic or something like that. Um, so typically you've got the, the coil resting on some foam blocks and you rest the plenum on those similar same size foam blocks. So now you've got two pieces. You're not relying on the adhesives to hold the, the plenum up, but you are relying on those adhesives to to keep everything together. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, it gets hot and cold and hot and cold. Yeah, so so best practices um, that I've found anyway, the best thing, the best strategy that I've found is to encapsulate the end of the plenum that you're connecting to the coil, encapsulate that part in mastic. And that's going to stop any of the fibers from getting into the airstream. You then push that plenum up into the, the coil chassis, and the mastic is then going to form a bond straight there, wherever the, the plenum is touching. Then I put tape around the outside, and then on Mesh top of tape. that, uh, I do foil tape, uh, either hard cast tape, which is mastic impregnated, or I do foil tape, and then uh, a layer of mesh tape on the top of that, and mastic all in that mesh and on top of that mesh. So that's that's how I, I seal it. But you're right that it's completely reliant upon adhesives, uh, as opposed to a metal plenum, which you could then use a mechanical faster or screw mm-hmm, to, uh, mm-hmm. to put it on. Okay, that was fascinating. And that was valuable, by the way, if, if you want to rewind and listen to the right way to connect a plenum. We're going to do the right way to connect a flex duct in a minute. So, yeah, keep in mind, you know, you're in part of the witness protection program here. You can just speak your mind. <laughs> so what do you see as far as plenum equipment chassis connections? Are they, is that often a leakage spot or how, yeah. how do other people connect that's, them? That's a great question. Thanks. Um, basically, I see a lot of people use tape and then hopefully mastic on top of the tape. And what ends up happening uh, most of the time is the unit typically has oils on it. 
and the adhesives in the tape don't respond well to those oils, uh, especially if it's a horizontal unit in the attic or something. When they put the mastic on the tape underneath the unit, um, the adhesives in the tape fail before the mastic sets up, and the weight of the mastic pulls down on the, the tape that you just put up. So oh now you goodness. have this huge seam that's at the highest pressure point of the yeah. entire system is now open underneath, and that's actually one of the first places I look whenever I go into any attic for any system. I look underneath the coil to supply plenum transition uh, to see if there's any tape tape that's come loose. And isn't that typically where a lot of condensation might form as well, especially if it's in a hot attic? Yeah. Definitely. So, yeah, so not only do you have cold air blowing out, that you then also have uh, potential for condensation and then growth or something to happen. Yeah, and the Venturi effect, you've got the air handler's air going so fast... It could actually suck the attic air into that. Definitely, definitely. And here's the worst and part. And the return could have a similar condition. And, and this is how growth happens there uh, is, okay, units running, blowing, blasting. Uh, cold Interior air. surfaces of the duct are going to be 55 degrees. No, colder. They're going to be like 45. Degrees. Yeah, 45. Yeah, so that then it's shuts 55 off. 55 by the time it comes out. Uh-huh. So the air handler shuts off, and now the hot, humid attic air is going to want to make its way into the right. cold, relatively dry um, interior conditions. And that, to me, is making mainly how growth happens at, at the unit, aside from moisture in the space, moisture in the attic due to duct leakage. I so. get it. So that Gaussian curve that I see in my duct, it's really just showing a temperature profile. It's like the cold mm-hmm. temperature is extended farthest down the middle and less far down the side. Mm-hmm. And then after my unit turned off, there's been leakage coming in. Or even, I mean, even if it's not leaking, even if it's sealed tightly, you go through, like from that cold supply plenum, through the equipment through the return in my house it's not very far back to my house mm-hmm. so now I have this you know hottest air at my ceiling it can come in that's mm-hmm. fascinating I'm going to move on from from duct board to flex duct so we've got the plenum we put the collars in and it was interesting you were pointing out that the collars can be a spot where the non-resin impregnated fiberglass is exposed to the airstream, which is a shame. Uh, the collars can have takeoff balancing dampers on them, which is a great idea. The balancing dampers should be installed such as the axis damper is perpendicular to the flow of air coming in, which often doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to make it like a little scoop, basically. Uh, we're getting some tips here on plenum design, whether it's interesting or not. So now, what is flex duct? Can you describe that and how you connect it? Yeah, so um, I should have looked up these definitions before coming in. Uh, That's all right. So, this, is, this is a pop quiz. <laughs> so flex duct. Uh, it's a slinky wrapped in saran wrap. <laughs> starting from inside, it's going to be a, uh, a thin plastic that is going to be strengthened with a spiral. I think it's polyethylene. Polyethylene. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be um, basically reinforced with a spiral of metal, um, I guess, Steel or what yeah, I'm not it's sure. Like it's a steel, I guess. Like an yeah, extended slinky. Exactly. So then, on the outside of that is typically going to be either R6 or R8 of fiberglass insulation, and then on so the just out- a normal pink, fluffy, or yellow, fluffy. Exactly. Yes. Uh-huh. Typically, okay. it's just fiberglass. I don't think that they make it in other types of insulation. That would be interesting, though. I don't think so either. But. Um, so uh, then on the outside of that is a um, basically a vapor barrier. So it's a thin, typically foil, uh, that's also reinforced with other fibers in it. But uh, that layer is there specifically to protect the insulation and also stop any vapor from moving in to try and condense on that cold duct that's inside mm-hmm. that insulation. So it's important. It's a very important layer. Very important. So you have the air, the pressure liner on the interior... And then you have this vapor diffusion barrier that's also a radiant barrier on the exterior and Mm -hmm. insulation in between. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, this this episode is not on duct board and flex as product lines because, frankly, there's there's lots of different types of flex. There's lots of different types of duct board. And up and down the quality scale, too. But generally speaking, as you're saying, you, you see dust collecting in dirt. So could you describe for me how you connect... What's the right way to connect a piece of flex duct to a start collar. 
Yeah, so uh, the first thing I want to say is that uh, when you're connecting the star collar to a flex, or, sorry, a star collar to a piece of duckboard, you're going to want to, again, impregnate, uh, basically line the exterior, the exposed parts of the fiberglass with mastic, and then you're going to want to seat the starting collar into that. Then you're going to want to fold the tabs down to, to properly secure that starting collar. Then after that, you're going to, um, this is where I think that the method... Keep in mind, you're lying. Lying on your back upside down under right. her, you know, in some awkward yeah, position. Laying across some rafters, it's yeah, typically not a comfortable position you're in while you're doing this. Yeah. Um, then, uh, typically, you then sort of put a thin layer of mastic around the collar. You then slip the plastic of the flex onto the starting collar. And the idea here is that you want to make a continuous airliner from the plastic flex. Uh, extending onto the duckboard plenum. So, in other words, you've got mastic on the inside, you put the flex on, you then want to put more mastic on, sealing up any of the seams that are on the starting collar, and connect the mastic from the, um, the duckboard onto the plastic. Wow. So, uh, so that happens. Uh, at the same time, you're going to be putting a panduit strap on, so a mechanical fastener that's going to be holding that, that on as well. And if you have a damper in there, which you should, you then have to worry about you know poking a hole in the flex and making sure the damper is in a good place. Um, yeah. After after you do that, you're then going to put the uh, the basically what I do is I fold over the the vapor liner uh, into the insulation and then push that all onto the mastic that I've now coated onto that. So now I've got a, a solid vapor barrier as well. So I've got continuous airliner and continuous vapor barrier um, all the way through, and all of that. Uh, another panduit strap. Oh, and then another panduit strap on top of that, and then you have to then worry about the damper, making sure you didn't impede the lever yeah. of the damper once that panduit strap goes on. Um, so all of that is, you know, multiple layers of mastic. It's a pretty messy process. Uh, if you do it correctly, you get pretty messy. Yeah. So, so you know, th this is more like a, a commentary, I guess, but... So what I've noticed over the last 10 years is that people don't like it if you suggest that flex duct and duckboard are not the best materials to make these systems out of. And yet, you guys listening, you heard that description. This is not easy to do, right? Doing it wrong is not like substantially easier than doing it right. You're still in a very uncomfortable situation. I don't get it. It's like they're it's like installers are arguing for this difficult, challenging, uncomfortable thing. I guess metal isn't any easier, is it? Well, yeah, so the, the issue there to me is number of connections. So once you do that one connection at one end, you can then go to the other end and do the connection. Uh, when you have metal, you're right. talking connection, about every, connection, every connection, four connection. feet, there's another connection, another connection. Yeah. And so there's just a lot more connections with metal. Um, it, it, I think that any product, when used appropriately, can be effective. But, uh, you know, putting fiberglass in your airstream is going to be real difficult to get that out using duckboard. If you just went with a metal externally lined plenum instead of internally lined, then you wouldn't even have that issue by design. Mm -hmm. And you could so. always clean it. And mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, speaking of the, the lovely notion that you could go from the start collar all the way to the terminal device with one run of flex, technically, as soon as you needed to bend it more than 45 degrees, you needed a metal, metal fitting. Correct, correct. And two more, two more fitting, two more connections. Mm -hmm. Ay, ay, ay. So, I mean, I guess to, to wrap up, duckboard and flex is going to be dirtier than metal. It's going to be worse for your air quality long term. Um, however... Can you do duckboard and flex in the appropriate way where it's going to be great and last a pretty long time? Yeah, it takes a lot of effort to do that, but you can you can get that done. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to last as long as. And you have to inspect means, it like incredibly closely as yeah. an owner or a person with a exactly. general contractor. Yeah, like in the ideal situations where you have a dehumidifier, where you're going to know that your humidity is going to be managed the whole time, where mm -hmm. filters are going to be changed often, um, all of these different things. And you've left you, room for a good installation to happen. Exactly. 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 As long as every uh, every one of those things has happened, then yeah, you can probably get away with using um, uh, duckboard and flex. Uh, people would say that duckboard and flex are more forgiving. 
Uh, but I would actually say the opposite in that they're less forgiving when it comes to poor under air quality environments. If you have metal in there, the chances of it, you know, growing anything are very, very slim. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like the metal is to me the way to go. Mm-hmm. Good. And so you just reminded me of an important question. Um, so I have a flex duct duct board plenum system in my house. My house is now 20 years old. You know, I look at it and I'm like, it's pretty old. It's pretty worn out. How, how long do you think they will last for? You know, even a pretty good one, right? Like, That's a really great question, and it yes, really de- make depends. I mean, like, you know, they said that this would last like 20 years type of thing. Like, oh, this is a 20-year install of mm-hmm. duckboard and flex. But I see stuff that's uh, from the late 80s that still looks to be okay. Um, you know, after the gray model Wait, there's flex. that gray, yeah. Yeah, so after that. So what, right when they first started using the silver, I've been in and expected some, some of that. And that seems to be okay. In other words, what I mean by okay is it's in a you know it's in a shaded, cool attic. It doesn't get super super hot. Doesn't have a whole lot of UV, I guess, to sort of degrade some things. Uh, the me- the the plastic inside still feels very uh, supple. Doesn't feel brittle at all, and uh, you know seems to be okay. And the sealants on it are relatively undisturbed and, and seem to be okay. So. I don't know. I don't know the answer for mm-hmm. how so long there is no one answer. Yeah, uh, it's about install and about the attic itself and how you know what sort of conditions are in it. So mm-hmm. like rodents. Yeah, the rodents. rodents are a big one. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, and so it sounds like you've seen some forty-ish year old flex duct duckboard systems that are in okay shape, mm-hmm. and yeah. you've seen some that are just. Like, tell me about a, a bad yeah. system you've seen. Yeah, so uh, it's really interesting to look at the the duckboard plenums from back then uh, that really start to degrade. Like, and these are some of the systems we don't clean because you just stick your finger into it and your finger just sinks into the the fibers, and so basically you're just crushing all of the degraded fiberglass, I guess, in this duckboard. Um, oh, wow. And it's it, going to get into the air. Yeah, and it just immediately gets into the air. And this was before they put in those resin impregnated liners to sort of protect that first layer. Um, so, yeah, there, there's definitely some times where it's just, as long as nobody disturbs it, don't touch it. it you know, hopefully all that's going to stay inside your ducts and not come out into your airstream. But, you know, that's the hope. Probably what happens in real life is some of those smaller particles start to break down and then come into the airstream. Oh, Absolutely. So, Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's, what gets me is like I mean, it's a re- like a heartache kind of, it's a poignant emotion. Is that you could have like a really fastidious, like kind of neat freakish owner, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they're never going to clean their duct system, right? And yet, as far as their like pollutant exposure to their bodies, that's such an important thing to clean. And they could be cleaning and cleaning. Meanwhile, you know, you could have a a slovenly owner with a nice metal system that stays clean. It's, mm-hmm. it's like it has nothing to do with like what kind of person you are, what, what kind of clean duct system you'll have. You've been in this business a while now. Like what? How how long? Five years? Uh, two thousand. So end of two thousand eleven yeah. was when we um, seven so, years. Seven years. Yeah. So is it? Are you? Getting more work with time, less work with time. I mean, what's it like? Yeah, uh, I think that our business is sort of changing. You know, when we first started, uh, you know, as with any startup, it was really difficult to sort of build traction. And but each year we continue to grow. Uh, you know, revenue continues to grow. We are, you know, we now have an employee that we have full time, and you know, we hire out when we have bigger jobs. So we, we have access to sort of, mm-hmm. you know, uh, people that can help us. Uh, whereas in the beginning, it was just us two and uh you know so i definitely think we've come a long way uh in those seven or eight years we have a whole lot more room to to grow and really really grow this thing we've got lots of trailers available the issue i think also comes down to uh our region and mm-hmm. that uh you know most homes that are duckboard and flex maybe have 200 cfm of, of leakage and that's a lot 200 basketballs every minute going out of your system uh it's hard to see that and quantify that for homeowners, yeah. and uh, they, it's it's just a difficult difficult sell to sell them on something they can't see. Yeah. So also, we've had some interesting commercial jobs this year. Now I was about to say when he said grit and getting into it, I was thinking grit comes from integrity. Yeah. But uh, yeah, tell yeah, about so, the commercial one here. Yeah, so so uh, we got and a lot of times when it's in commercial, they're actually failing a test, and when they're failing a test, they can't. So it's at the front end, it's still new yes, construction. Still new construction, they can't move on to the next phase, and so then they realize, hey, we surrounded the shaft in concrete, we can't get to it. We're oh. 
you know, it's 38 stories high. Yeah, we did a big hotel in Austin this year, and it was uh, the smoke evac shafts mm. um, that went up 30 the evac floors. Evac smoke from Yeah, so if there's, a, if there's a fire on the floor, then these dampers open up, but the fan kicks in on the roof. Oh, wow. And it sucks the smoke out from the floor below, the floor of, and the floor above, where the fire is. And so that kicks out the smoke outside. And it gives a chance for people to get out of the building mm-hmm. when it when it's on fire. Um, but these metal um, risers were leaking. Uh, was it like sixty percent or something? Mm-hmm. It was a lot. Yikes! And so they they couldn't pass their their test. And so we went in and uh, aero sealed those shafts. And uh, thirty eight floor vertical shaft. How did you yeah. do that? We hooked up on the roof, and so we blocked off at every. Uh, at every vent, every damper was sealed off, and then we injected from the roof and pressurized it and sealed it down way, way below the code. I think we got it down to like whatever, two or three percent, and passing was at ten percent. Wow! And so, yeah, it was super tight. Um, it was the second hotel we'd done, we did another one earlier in the year as well. Um, and that was also under construction, <clears throat> exactly the same uh, hmm. concerns. Uh, but immediately, within four or five hours, they were passing and ready to move on to the next phase of construction. Wow. And you, you repelled inside a shaft somewhere, right? Mm. Was that the same project? or Different, different? one. Yeah. Yeah. That was, how was that? Eight stories? Yeah. It was, it was 110 feet. Yeah. So it was... Yeah. That's high. Eight stories. So, yeah, it gets sort of scary and challenging, but yeah, that was a good one. Thank you. That's a, that's a lot about air distribution systems. All right, so let's do a few minutes to talk about Aero Barrier. That's your new business venture. You're taking a very similar technology to Aero Seal, similar material used in a similar way. But you're doing Aero Barrier, and you recently shared a story with me that I really would love to share with, with more listeners. You Aero Barriered your own home. Yes, I did. Yeah, so tell, um, tell us about that. How? What was it like to start with? And, yeah, so uh, it was one of the first homes that we aero barriered, and I wanted to do it because I wanted to know firsthand what it's like to live in a tighter house. Uh, what what that means from a ventilation perspective? What that means from an air quality perspective? Feel perspective. Uh, yeah, am I going to be um, needing to ventilate more? What's going to happen inside my home from a six ACH fifty house um, down to what's ultimately, I guess, for right now. A 2.9 ACH 50 house. So I basically cut my leakage in half. Um, same house, same people. Exactly. Same living conditions, just cut the air leakage in half. So, uh, so for the listeners, uh, I have a, a home built in 1999. Um, it's built okay. Um, obviously, I've done some heavy modifications to the duct system, and I've <laughs> put in a lot of insulation in the attic. Dehumidifier. Uh, yeah, like R60 in the attic, uh, a separate dehumidifier that's ducted into the supply plenum. So I've done a lot of work to it to, to make it good. Um, I've extended my... I uh, basically expanded my return plenum to fit more air filters so I can put in uh, a wider uh, sort of more surface area in the filter so I can really uh, use a MERV 16 filter without it affecting static pressure. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, so I've done all these things to improve my air quality. And so for the past two years, I've been living in this house with really great, decent indoor air quality. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I monitor temperature and humidity throughout the house in the attic and the duct systems outside and then I have a couple of food bots that I also monitor and uh, a CO indoor, detector uh, and a, yeah a CO detector as well um, so uh, anyway so I, I've got all of these things set up and I know how my house feels in a 6 ACH 50 environment so um, I guess something else to clarify is what ACH 50 is uh, I'm talking about the air changes of the volume inside my house with the outside air so uh, under uh, the test pressure of 50 pascals it's going to change with the air, the outside air, six times, uh, which is somewhat leaky. Code here in Austin is five, and with Aero Barrier, I reduced that leakage down to 2.9 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. So uh, a significant reduction. And uh, when I'm talking about those numbers, I'm talking about an apples to apples comparison of blower door tests. My actual leakage that I got with Aero Barrier, I sealed it down really, really tight. But then when you, you know, take the tape off the windows and put in the you know your actual doors where the weather stripping is, uh, 
different things are going to leak more, and so that's why I, I got the, the ultimate number that I did of mm-hmm. 2.9. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so I did an experiment after, after we aero buried. I didn't ventilate my house. I wanted to know what would happen if you didn't ventilate a house that should be ventilated. So code in Austin is five air changes per hour, and at that five ACH, it says in the code, you need to add ventilation to this house. And uh, you need to follow ASHRAE standards and all of these things. Um, so I want to know well, what happens if you don't do that. And so <laughs> you can't uh, survive in a, in a six ACH fifty house. I did not need to ventilate. My air was perfect the way it was. I, so I thought, and everything was fine. You're monitoring carbon dioxide with the food box. Correct, correct. And, and as we Wait, know, carbon dioxide. Staying at a thousand, or yeah, it was in a reasonable range between seven hundred and a thousand. Most days. And, okay, and, go ahead. What you're gonna say? As yeah, we know, as we know, <laughs> Fubots don't accurately monitor uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, it's a extrapolation of VOCs. Um, it gives you an estimation. It's not an actual thing. So if you're going to be monitoring and if you care much about carbon dioxide, you should probably get a standalone sensor for that uh, aside from using the Fubot. So, so like the Telair 7001 is one, but but the Air Visual Pro is a multi-sensor that has an actual CO2 Correct. detector and, in it. And as I think we've, we've said in a couple of other podcasts I've heard of yours is that hopefully Fubot's going to be coming out with a new yeah. uh, awesome like mm-hmm. professional use device that's going to monitor a bunch of different things separately. So it's going to have its own CO2 monitor yeah. uh, in it. And we plan to get uh, both Air Visual and Fubot on the same episode. Talking nice. And that should be good. Oh, that's going to be great. So, um, so anyway, so I didn't ventilate for 10 days. And, and your um, wife was still there. Your cats were still there. Correct. And everything was business as normal in my house. So I didn't change anything about how I'm using my house. I only just air barrier. That's it. Um, one of the first things I noticed about having a tighter house was smells. So the smell, like I cook, I cook dinner, for example, before that smell would be localized to the kitchen, maybe the living room. Um, I don't have a good exhaust in my, uh, my kitchen. Unfortunately, it's not been to the outside and it's just the position of where it is. I'm, I'm working on it. I, I now I've I've got the confidence to (laughs) drill through my brick and actually get a good, um, you know, exhaust to the outside. So I'm going to be doing that soon, but really you can um, drill through brick. I'm going to be, yeah, I, I figured that out finally. I've got the confidence. That's um, awesome. Yeah. So anyway, back back to, to what's going on. Um, I uh, now I'm smelling these smells that were just in my kitchen. I'm now smelling them in my master bedroom upstairs. Hmm. And they're lingering for much longer. Uh, hmm. Maybe a day, maybe two days of, of a smell in my house that's never been there before. And it's also never moved to my master bedroom before. Um, so that was really interesting. What happens when you tighten a building envelope and how those smells can linger we're not just talking about smells, but we're talking about VOCs. We're yeah, talking that's about, what the smells are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's not just the fact that it was smelling. It's the fact that yeah. uh, it, it could be... Causing. Those are indoor pollutants that aren't being Correct. diluted. They're not making their way outside. Yeah. Exactly. So I also found out that uh, my humidity now was higher. Uh, the humidity that was... that and I'm you generally- turned the dehue off for a while. Uh, well, correct. So um, previously, 6ACH50, I actually didn't need my dehumidifier, but maybe two, three times a year. Wow. Most of the time, my um, two-stage my system. two-stage system was enough. Even though it was an oversized unit, it was enough to dehumidify my house uh, when it needed dehumidifier. Mm-hmm. Um, but now uh, that I'm running the AC a whole lot less because there's less infiltration, um, the, the AC isn't actually running, therefore I'm not dehumidifying, and so the indoor uh, latent load seems to be trapped yeah. inside the house more. And uh, so I was noticing high humidity, uh, oh, high. 65% Whoa. relative humidity. Um, you keep your house around 75, 70? 72-ish. 72, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and so uh, at times, because the AC wasn't running as much, I would actually turn it up a little bit to sort of raise the temperature and hopefully sort of decrease the relative humidity anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. So, uh, so higher humidity. Also, the Fubot was going off a whole lot more. 
Um, I mean, turning orange. Turning orange, exactly. Mm-hmm. When I say going off, I mean turning orange, meaning bad indoor quality events are happening. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was saying that my uh, carbon dioxide levels, my VOC levels, uh, my humidity was high. My uh, particulates was the only thing that obviously remained low you have uh, good filters. throughout because I have good filters. And now technically it should be even better because I have a tighter enclosure. Mm-hmm. Um, but That's it's right. hard to measure below, you know, the, the FUBOT typically reads about one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've forgotten what the, the metric is. But yeah, one uh, microgram per cubic meter. Yes, exactly. So yeah, there's not very much. Um, That's amazingly uh, low. Yeah, mine's yeah. reading like twelve. I the time. and I also I guess I should note that I have a couple of um, indoor in in room air purifiers as well. Uh, we have cats. And indoor quality is important to me. So, you know, around the litter box, for example, I have an air uh, filter and purifier that's going to be right there next to where the litter is. You so, happy cats. And uh, things were really starting to seem like get worse. And oh, finally, my goodness. Uh, finally, I decided, okay, 10 days is enough. I have to now start um, start ventilating my house. So I turned on the DHU, and my DHU is a ventilating DHU. So I've now got 35 CFM continuously brought into my house, continuously circulating. And after... After about a day of ventilating and dehumidifying, everything is back to normal. It's as if I didn't seal my house. Uh, the FUBOT readings, the air quality readings, all seem to be great. The smells don't linger anymore. So, Fascinating. So ventilating was the solution uh, to having a tight house. And so uh, these people that have... Imagine um, that. <laughs> have a new house and they don't know what their ventilation does or what it means, uh, they could be just turning it off. And oftentimes I hear that from major contractors that that Mm -hmm. they just, they just turn off the ventilation because it's adding too much latent load to the house. You're bringing in too much, uh, outside air that's going to be humid. That's going to create, you know, uh, conditions that could lead to problems inside for indoor quality. But you need that ventilation, and I now witnessed it firsthand why you need ventilation in a house, and uh, and those are the reasons I just explained. As soon as I ventilated, all of those issues just went away immediately. Well, wow. within a day. Wow. So. Mm-hmm. You just remind people about the ventilation comment. It's so important. I mean, like, as long as you're breathing in the house, you want good, breathable air in the house. So mm-hmm. it's important to do it. But uh, final thoughts? Anything you guys want to say? Well, I think to, to that point is that, you know, a lot of times, you know, when it comes to Aero Barrier and IAQ Texas, you have a lot of phoned-in houses that they do that very thing and they turn off their ventilation. Yeah. uh, Because it is tight and because they don't think they need it. Yeah. They don't know what they don't know. Or they want to save energy at the expense of air quality. And so consequently, they don't know that they're actually causing themselves harm. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of times, from a duct leakage perspective, they pass that code test because the ducts are within the envelope. And so therefore, just because they're leaking, it doesn't mean that it's a problem. Yeah. And yet, you know, the foam can continue to off-gas. Yeah. That uh, air conditioning system then pulls in that mm-hmm. off gassing and distributes it around that. <laughs> there house. you go. How would you like this everywhere? And then people become chemically sensitive yeah. to these things and they get sick, and nobody really understands why they're sick, but they're surrounding themselves by chemicals yeah. that are off gassing inside the house. And that's a big subject yeah. for another day. All right. Thank you guys both very much. Thank and you. Thank you all, all right. for listening. Thank you. That was great.